Good morning, everyone. Thank you for connecting on today's uh, class. Let's pray and begin. I would like to request somebody on the call to please go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer. I'll pray. Yes, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great moment that you've given and us as a family to come and learn about your word, about your truth, Father Jehovah, and permit everybody who is online, Jehovah will bless us, give us the spirit of knowledge and understanding as we learn this great truth that will change our lives for the better. Father, commit even those who have not changed, Father Jehovah, that will hasten them, whatever they are, Father, that they can gain. I pray for everybody, even our fellow students who are not with us, Today, Father Jehovah, I commit them Father into thy hands, Father Jehovah. I pray, believing and trusting in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that all is going to be well. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kennedy. Uh, so now let's get into uh, the study of the next book, which would be the book of James. Uh, and we will uh, begin from chapter one. So I was thinking maybe we can read the entire chapter first and then get into uh, the understanding of the verses. So we won't do it uh, like Hebrews. What we did, it, we did is uh, we did it section by section. Uh, but over here, We'll read the entire chapter and then, because uh, the sections here have a theme running through it. So then what I'll do as I'm sharing is I will just uh, touch upon each of the themes and then keep moving forward. So that way uh, things get faster. Um, so the first chapter has about 27 verses. What I would recommend is maybe uh, five of us can read it. The first four can read five, five verses uh, at once. And the last person can please read seven verses. That way we'll read the full chapter. Please read slowly so that everyone can hear and sort of uh, soak it in. And then I'll go ahead and the key themes that are coming through the chapter, I'll touch upon that. And then we move on to the next chapter. We'll read the whole chapter and then uh, see the meaning. Uh, and similarly, the other chapter. So a total of five chapters are there in the book of James. Let's see how far we can get today. So uh, uh, let's begin with uh, James chapter one. Uh, any, any, anybody just, you know, jump right in, do five <laughs> verses and the next person can continue. Yes, Christopher. James one. Yeah. Um, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brother, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. Amen. Was uh, 11... For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. 
for when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life which god has promised to those who love him let no one say when he is tempted i am being tempted by god for god cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown brings, brings forth death next is verse 16 do not be deceived my beloved brethren every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures so then my beloved brethren let every man be swift to hear slow to speak slow to wrath for wrath for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of god Verse 21. Read from 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. By be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror for he observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and Sorry, and it's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the works. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you think he is righteous, he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceive his own heart. This one's religious is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself on stop of, on stop from the world amen okay thank you uh, to all those who read um, the scripture so far so we'll begin to uh, look at the book of james and we'll see what it has to offer us so um, as we look at the writer himself so it's pretty clear that uh, this was written by apostle james james uh, we see three jameses in uh, the disciples of jesus so here the james that we are talking about is the half brother of our lord jesus christ um, and the other uh, brother of the lord jesus is jude so we will also be going through the book of jude very soon so james and jude they were half brothers of the lord jesus and uh, we see that uh, 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 in the life of james like the other brothers of jesus uh, he did not believe uh, in uh, jesus as the savior as god initially so uh, the four brothers and sisters uh, of the lord jesus they all grew up with him uh, but even though they were a close-knit family scriptures tell us that they were actually unbelievers in john chapter 7 verse 5 we see that uh, even the brothers of Jesus did not believe in him. So uh, that was how 
James was. But something changed for him after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So he came to put his trust in Jesus and he came to become a very fervent believer. Uh, once he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, we know that, uh, you know, he later took up a leadership role in the early church as well. So that's how uh, there was a turning point in his life. And uh, uh, he is now a notable uh, personality uh, as far as the New Testament is concerned. So uh, he... Once his turning point came, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, uh, it says that uh, even uh, James, right, he was, uh, that um, after he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, so talking about the resurrected Christ, uh, even James saw his own brother. And that's what we see uh, in uh, the book of Acts when we read about the disciples waiting uh, for the promise of the Father. Uh, we notice that uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, Acts 1.14. So brothers, James was also part of this believing church. So uh, as I uh, shared, he became one of the leaders of the church. So initially we see another James. Okay, another James. Uh, he is called James the Lesser for whatever reason. Okay, James the uh, Lesser. Uh, when I mentioned uh, three Jameses, sorry, so it's a, not actually another James, but then the mention of James is uh, the father of Judas. So Judas's father is, is uh, James. Uh, and that's how another, you know, James comes into the picture when we discuss about the disciples of Jesus. So this James, being the half brother of the Lord Jesus, is also called as uh, James the Just. So, uh, you know, some terminology which was used to recognize them. So James the Lesser or another disciple uh, or apostle, he was martyred. We know uh, in Acts chapter 12, we read about it, how Herod put a sword uh, to his uh, neck and then uh, he was killed. So one James was killed. And then the other James, which is James that just uh, received a prominence in the early church. So uh, when we read uh, about the leadership in the church, making decisions, we read about a James. So that would be uh, this James, Jesus's brother. Um, and so uh, he's very prominent in Acts chapter 15, when the decree uh, is uh, spelt out to the Gentiles about circumcision. So uh, uh, that is when he was, you know, completely uh, uh, in leadership and uh, 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 providing uh, guidance to God's people. So that's a little bit about the ministry of uh, James the Just. Uh, he's part of the eldership of uh, the Church of Jerusalem. So what else do we know about him? Uh, we uh, do know that uh, from reliable uh, church history that uh, he was martyred. Uh, he was thrown from the top of a the pinnacle of a temple. Uh, he was stoned and beaten to uh, death by the Pharisees. Uh, so, uh, you know, he was martyred. Uh, other things that we know about him is that he is uh, uh, seen to have been a very devout uh, believer and a prayer warrior. So uh, uh, something like, uh, you know, uh, tradition has it that uh, he was he was someone who used to pray on his knees uh, to such an extent that his knees uh, uh, turned you know that the skin uh, was was completely black because of kneeling down like he, it it became uh, uh, sore and all all that so he used to pray to that extent is what uh, it is said about him uh, now when was the book of james written uh, since he was in leadership uh, between Acts 12 to Acts 15 so the timeline there is somewhere around uh, 45 AD of Jerusalem Council. So that's when uh, he actually wrote this uh, book. And primarily, some you know, some of his terminology will uh, refer to Jewish believers because at that time, yes, Gentiles were getting saved, but not so many. Primarily, the uh, church was very Jewish, uh, and so you know, terms like synagogue and all. So he'll use that because uh, that has to do with the Jewish, Jewish people. So he wrote it 
to the Jewish people, not intending to write to them, but the church, the composition of the church had uh, mainly uh, Jewish people. So that is the reason. And uh, uh, this was written not just to the believers in uh, Jerusalem, but even outside uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, uh, and you know, uh, so the message that it contains is uh, uh, applicable to believers all across. Uh, yeah, and uh, sometimes the book of James goes uh, unnoticed, or maybe you could say, like, you know, in terms of uh, uh, preference, so people don't prefer James uh, because they feel, oh, it's, it's not so much doctrine it's more about you know do this do that practical instructions to the body of christ uh, and so for some believers they don't they don't find it very profound but you know all of scripture is uh, god breathed inspired by god and it is useful for us for correction uh, reproach and uh, you know just to grow in the lord so we don't uh, we don't uh, try to put one book up above the other it's about what god is trying to speak to us and the wisdom that he's imparting to us so uh, that is why the book of James is also very, very important. Now, as we study uh, the book of James, we will see uh, uh, it, it's it's uh, uh, if you consider the book of Proverbs, there uh, verse by verse, the topics change. You know, some uh, time it's talking about listening and then it moves on to talking about the rich and then it moves on to talking about integrity. So you would find here that uh, very quickly James switches from a certain topic to the other. So uh, it's not a disconnect. He's just trying to place emphasis on things that are important. And that's how we would uh, take that up. So there is continuity in some sections. But then in some other sections, he just jumps to uh, a new topic. So we, we receive it in that manner. And uh, he talks a lot about faith. Uh, we will look at it uh, in all the chapters. Uh, faith is like a common subject uh, that he touches on. So he makes points like, uh, you know, faith sustains us when we go through trials. Uh, faith uh, is the key in prayer. When we ask God, we must believe. Only then we receive. Uh, then he uh, talks about how faith is expressed in uh, uh, how we face temptation and resist the devil. Um, faith receives the word of God and follows it through to action. Uh, he will talk about the balance of uh, works and faith. He'll talk about uh, uh, the demonstration of faith uh, in through the way we treat people. You know the, that we should treat people equally. There mustn't be partiality, um, and uh, you know faith depends on mercy of God and not on the law. So it goes on. You know, so many of these themes are there. Uh, 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 we have very comprehensive notes uh, in our APC resources. We've done this book, James, in uh, uh, the sermon series. So uh, I'm just sharing uh, what is enlisted for us in those notes. So you, you are free to use those notes. They're available on our website. Uh, you can also uh, study uh, different versions of, of the Bible, uh, as we generally encourage us to do for uh, uh, the third year classes, and also uh, Enduring Word of uh, David Gozik. So these are a few uh, key uh, references that you can go to to gain an understanding of the book of James. So now we'll come to the actual chapter itself. So here, as we look at uh, what uh, James has uh, introduced himself as, uh, it's interesting because he says, uh, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. So uh, notice, uh, being the brother of Jesus, if any of us were uh, uh, family to Jesus, then uh, we might have a tendency to boast about our closeness and uh, talk about you know experiences that we've had uh, with the Lord Jesus, but that's not how he describes himself. So we understand that he uh, knew Jesus more as 
savior and lord than his earthly brother and that's why he says a born servant of god and of the lord jesus christ so he is calling himself uh, a born servant born servant is a terminology used uh, to describe a slave uh, somebody who is in uh, a permanent relation of service or uh, servitude to another and in the greek sense in those days when uh, you know uh, uh, james was using this term uh, born servant was considered very uh, uh, it's a degrading term because uh, people like their freedom and uh, they wouldn't want to be recognized as a slave or a bond servant and yet he uses this term bond servant and we know that in the uh, greek it's doulos so he's saying you know i'm a slave to my lord and uh, there he says lord jesus christ so his brother he is calling him lord and that's uh, the uh, you know greek word kurios over there which uh, assigns greatness and mastery uh, to jesus christ so that is his uh, understanding of uh, his relationship with the lord jesus so that's really amazing uh, and you know notice how he says um, uh, um, the 12 tribes to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greetings so why 12 tribes i told us that this was one of the early letters which was written uh, and at that time gentiles were part of the uh, the body but they were not so many uh, and so that is why uh, it seems like he's addressing the jewish audience more uh, and obviously uh, you know uh, he brings them greetings as he starts off the book and then he comes to uh, facing trials he's addressing that matter so what can we understand from this we can understand that the audience was of course in uh, some sort of uh, uh, troubled situation we know the season of uh, the early church uh, that uh, in fact, the seasons of the early church that uh, there was a lot of persecution which was going on and thereby uh, people were uh, facing difficulty. They were also scattered. The communities were scattered ac uh, across the nations uh, at that point. So uh, that is why, you know, he is uh, describing regarding trials and what one must do in trials. Um, so he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials so uh, he is not encouraging the believers to fall uh, into trials or he is not uh, you could say um, yeah uh, coming back to that word trials there in some translations when we read it it is uh, mentioned as temptations Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into all kinds of temptations. But when we look up the Greek word, the uh, appropriate word there would be trials. So trials is adversity. It is, uh, uh, you know, going through difficulty. So that is what trials is. And he says, when you go through count it all joy when you go through so he is not encouraging us to go through trials but trials happen is uh, what his perspective is then another thing he uh, uh, states is he doesn't say if you go through count it all joy brethren if you go to uh, go through and if he had stated it that way then we know that maybe trials come only to some people and others are exempt but that's not his terminology. He says, count it all joy when do you go through trials. So the implication is that all of us as believers will go through trials. And uh, at that time, he is calling us to look at it with joy. Count it, uh, uh, with, count it all joy. So it's an attitude that he is calling us to maintain. Uh, you know, maintain... Um, maintain joy in the lord 
you know maintain that stability in the lord and jesus said you know nothing different even jesus said that that you will go through uh, so many challenges uh, it's in uh, john 16:33 even jesus said that we are going to face many hardships in our life but as a believer what is the stand that we must take when we go through various trials so again you know we could just preach on that for a long time uh, because there's a lot that is being said over here uh, that we must keep our joy and he says count it all joy count it all joy meaning uh, uh, it's like uh, you deem it right you you um, you esteem it or you consider it you think of it uh, in a positive way when you go through trials now what is one advantage of uh, going through a trials uh, it is going to produce patience okay so uh, it is going to produce patience when when we count it all joy so we are thinking of it uh, and deeming it in a positive way and he says the word joy there is uh, cheerfulness rejoicing Okay, and calm delight so how is it that we can uh, have an attitude like this it's only when we put our trust in god that even when we go through trials and you know he in fact uh, uh, he says when you fall into fall into fall into means that from time to time in life for various reasons you know we also have a very active adversary the the devil uh, who is pushing us into Uh, you know different uh, trials uh, so and uh, the bible also talks about the fact that you know uh, we as believers go through tests uh, that god leads us through for our growth and our maturity so no matter what it is you know trials tests in those times to have an attitude of cheerfulness rejoicing when we fall into these things Uh, and what is it going to produce in us so it says that it's going to produce patience so what is patience patience is cheerful endurance or it is uh, the ability to continue with that calmness or you might want to call it <coughs> patient continuance so uh, that is what facing our trials with joy will produce in us so what patience is not is that it's not a passive state where we do nothing but patience is uh, when we are trusting god and if required right we are able to put in any form of action that is necessary so that's the way he calls us to be and uh, what else does he say about uh, going through trials you know he says that it's going to the testing of your faith produces patience so the testing of our faith uh, you see the things that get tested are the precious things nobody goes and trusts uh, you know some form of uh, uh lower form of metal uh, or you know we we don't really care too much uh, about uh, things that are not precious but when we talk about uh, something that's precious let's say a metal like gold uh, we would want to try it and test it so it's the precious thing that actually get tested so here he wants us to know that when we are going through trials difficulties which we are thrust into we are not wantingly getting into it but we are thrust into we count it joy then he says you know that the testing of your faith so god is very concerned about the quality of the faith that we all carry it's so precious uh, and you know that gets tested and when it gets tested it's going to produce that patience so like a uh, a continued endurance that capacity will be produced in us and he also says but you know let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing so what is god interested in he's interested in our maturity he is interested in us becoming more 
Christ like and that's what he wants us to note there and he goes on to talking about a very very key thing which is required in trials and that is wisdom you know uh, uh, in difficult situations we may pray for many things we cry out to god and we say god uh, release me, deliver me, which are all very apt, uh, you know, prayers to pray. But one key thing to pray when we are going through trials of various kinds is to ask for wisdom. So he's saying now, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So he's encouraging the believers to seek wisdom during trial. So what is wisdom? You know, uh, wisdom is the uh, capacity to use knowledge. Knowledge is uh, raw information. We can all have a lot of information, but wisdom is about knowing how to apply it. You know, someone uh, once said that uh, knowledge is the ability to take things apart but wisdom is the ability to put things back together. So you see, applying the knowledge which we have is actually wisdom. So what he tells us is, he says that, you know, we may have this tendency to run to man or run to earthly resources, which is not wrong. But he wants us to know that God is our primary source of wisdom. And that's why the verse that follow, he says, you know, you ask God, and what is the nature of God? God is the one who gives liberally or he gives with abundance. So we serve a God of abundance and God will grant us abundant wisdom in the moments of our trial. And what else can we uh, notice about God here? It also says that he gives without reproach, which means that God does not resent it when we ask him for something and in this case wisdom he's not going to um, uh, you know uh, sh show us a clenched fist but he's the god of the open arms and the open hands and so he gives us with abundance and we can receive the the wisdom that god gives us we can apply it and we can see deliverance from our trials and he also states the importance of asking in faith so he says that when we ask god we must ask by faith that is when we are going to receive the answers of god so some other key highlights here you know we are told that uh when one asks without faith, there is a comparison made uh, and we are told that he's like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So what is the understanding? See, the understanding is that when we look at a wave of the sea, uh, it is without rest. It is unstable. It is uh, driven by the winds. There's no uh, anchor to to that wave of the sea. Uh, whenever a wind blows, the wave, uh, you know, uh, happens. Uh, and when a wave carries such uncontrollable energy, it can also be very destructive. You know, the way uh, huge waves uh, can destroy. Uh, human settlements and uh, you know maybe boats and ships. So we know we know the the uh, effects of uh, uh, a wave, a mighty wave. So we know that you know the the wave of the sea is referring to uh, instability and also uh, a destructive outcome. So he's saying the person without faith or when we are in unbelief, we are like the wind. Okay? We are like uh, this wave of the sea because there is um, instability in, in us, in the way we think. And then he goes on to introduce the term called as double-mindedness. So what is double-mindedness? You know, double-mindedness is uh, to want two contrary things at the same time, two contrary things that we cannot possess at the same time. But a double-minded man cannot make up his mind. Or, a, you know, when I say man, it applies to women as well. So double-minded people 
they have one foot uh, uh, in one decision and uh, the other foot in the exact opposite decision and they want both to happen and they're just not able to make up their minds which one to pick so that is a state of being double minded or uh, you know it it is uh, it, it falls in the category of uh, 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 lacking faith or unbelief uh, and god god warns us about double mindedness he says look when you ask god uh, you're asking wanting to receive but in your heart of hearts if you think that god is not going to give you any way then don't even don't even uh, you know expect anything uh, because your prayer is one but your belief is different so you see there's no integrity there in the words that we are speaking and what is in in the depths of our hearts so he's warning us about double mindedness and uh, he makes a general statement saying a double minded man is unstable in all his ways okay now is this referring to we said yes of course it is referring to unbelief but uh, what about the times when people have had uh, little faith or uh, uh, you know weak faith the man who said uh, uh, you know help my unbelief i want to uh, believe help my unbelief so at least there is a desire to have faith uh, and jesus commended that so you know that's a different context and the double mindedness is a another context so that's how we are going to look at it so these are some key things that uh we notice here so let me just uh, pause for a moment are you all okay i know this is not like you know i'm not going uh, line by line but uh, just some important things uh for us to grasp uh, are you comfortable with the uh, the way things are moving any response okay sure Sure. Please uh, stop me if you're looking at a verse and you need more clarity on that. Uh, we can get into the depths of it. But uh, this is the way I thought I will uh, go through because you know, these are uh, not necessarily doctrinal uh, subjects. Okay. So we have come to the portion uh, of verses nine through eleven, and uh, you know he starts talking about uh, the rich and the poor here so let's have a look at that okay so he says let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation uh, but the rich in his humiliation because as a flower of the field he will pass away for no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it with us the grass its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits so uh, uh, the point is that he is trying to help us see how temporary uh, this earthly life is and in the earthly life we may have uh, you know classes uh, among people where some are uh, poor some are rich now why is he addressing this matter because there were rich people in the church and there were poorer people in the church uh, there were also rich employers and poor laborers uh, in the uh, church community and so he wanted to um, address the way they related with one another uh, and you know he um, uh, shares here how uh, we must be content with what god is doing in our lives okay so uh, he says let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation so as the lord lifts one up uh, uh, in their economic status we are thankful to god and uh, if uh, a rich person right a rich person um, learns to walk in humility it's not necessarily you know god uh, uh, putting somebody down because he doesn't do that to anyone so when we read about humiliation here it's just talking about humility you know the the uh, when they grow in humility then uh, they recognize they rec recognize that uh, 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 god is ultimately the source and he says how everything is so temporary that even somebody who is rich uh, they too they will fade away Right, fade away in their pursuit so it's just saying that uh, here in this earthly life whatever we possess is 
temporary but when we fix our minds as jesus said you fix your minds on things above and uh, uh, you know where your uh, where your treasure is there your heart will be so uh, save up for yourself treasures in heaven so have a more heavenly mindset so that would be the key of what is being said here yeah that everything is temporary and everything is fleeting okay coming to the section from verses 12 through 17 here he talks about uh, temptation so he says that blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved he will receive the crown of life which the lord has promised to those who love him so an encouragement to uh, overcome temptation we have studied so much about temptation uh, uh, we know that it is one of the methods of workings of satan he uses temptation to entice us into sin and that's uh, what happens when one gives uh, themselves into temptation but here we are talking about enduring temptation okay enduring is to uh, stand strong in the midst of temptation and few more things about temptation which he talks here now we can relate this to the earlier section where we said count it all joy when we fall into uh, various trials so that trials is different but here we are talking about temptations and notice he is uh, he is very clearly telling us that god is not the one who brings temptation on us right so he is not the source of temptation and similarly earlier also he said when you fall into trials so he is not saying god pushes us into trials so he says when uh, we are going through temptation uh, we must not say that i am tempted by god because god cannot be tempted by evil nor does he himself tempt anyone so god is not the source of our temptation now how does temptation happen uh, so there's some explanation here about it in verse 14 he says that each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed so satan can use the weaknesses of our flesh to lead us into temptation so that's the reason you know we must uh, uh, be free from uh, the pull of the flesh and as paul spoke you know to the ephesian church he said that uh, walk in the spirit uh, that you may not gratify the desires of the flesh so when we walk in the spirit we can overcome these desires that he is talking about his own desires and enticed so that enticed is uh, 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 allurement or you know drawing somebody attracting somebody towards uh, you know uh, something so that enticement is the work of the devil so he uses our own fleshly weaknesses to entice us into sin now the process of how uh, sin actually happens is also given verse 15 he says when desire has conceived so the desire is from within us there is external influence of satan through his temptation but uh, it happens when we kind of agree with with the temptation which is coming in so he says when desire has conceived uh, so the desire is there and it begins to grow in us so that's what he's saying so it's growing in us now it gives birth to we know that a desire leading to a certain pattern of thoughts and thoughts leading to actions actions leading to a uh, behavior behavior leading to you know a uh, 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 life uh, uh, lifestyle all that so then he refers to it as when it is full grown brings forth death so when we yield to it first we agree and then we yield to temptation then what happens it produces death so what does sin lead to sin finally leads to death so he is explaining how temptation really happens and that we must never credit temptation uh, upon god so Uh, again verse 15 he says don't be deceived my beloved brethren in this context you know he's saying that uh, uh, god doesn't tempt us so don't be deceived that it's god who is causing temptation and uh, you know that and, and that's uh, a sort of a, a way of thinking that people had uh, and now he's talking about god he says look who is god 
he is a good god he gives good gifts to us every good gift every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning so he is uh, encouraging us with the attributes of god and he says that you know god uh, gives he gives good things to us he gives good uh, gifts to us meaning things that we don't even deserve we receive from god and he says comes down from the father of lights now father of lights when you look that up uh, yeah, what is father of lights uh, so commentators say that uh, it simply has to do with uh, the heavenly lights we know that uh, the uh, lord created the heavens and the earth and uh, um, in the universe there are all these uh, you know sources of light uh, stars so it's probably referring to that uh, and it also says that uh, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning so that simply means that uh, he is stable you know and our god is a is a he's a constant and we can put our faith in him so moving ahead from uh, verses 18 through 25 uh, uh, here we are told um, so then my brethren let every man be swift to hear slow to speak slow to wrath so uh, he continues you know to give us wisdom uh, and particularly in trial so what should we do we should be other centered you know when we are other centered that's when we are keen on listening um we when we are self centered what happens we put greater value on our opinion our view of the whole uh, situation and so what do we end up doing is we speak more and we uh, even quickly uh, jump to conclusions and judge uh, matters and people so that's what he's saying no be other centered so be swift to hear that's what we tend to do when we listen more and uh, you know we want to gain other people's opinion as well so maintain this kind of an attitude and don't jump into uh, you know judging uh, matters too quickly or people too quickly because when we uh, show our wrath he says the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of god so we must really wait for that wise um, analysis of matters and not be too quick to judge and again you know he just uh, 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 you know he, he encourages the believer not to give in to temptation not to uh, give in to sinfulness uh, and so he says lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness instead receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul so he just talked about temptation and the internal desires that can lead us to be enticed and now he's saying you know stay away of sinfulness he uses the term filthiness here instead he shows us that we must have a teachable heart have a teachable heart uh, because it's the teachable heart which will receive the word of god with faith and when we receive the word of god with faith what happens he says that the implanted word so what is an implanted word implanted word is uh, when we receive it we mix it with faith in our hearts it gets planted in our system it gets planted in our spirit and this implanted word is able to save our souls okay so uh yeah let me just uh, pause here we are going to take a break now uh, uh any any questions or oh, i think it's pretty straightforward uh james is sharing with us still like if you have something to discuss we can take it up now yes shri kumar please go ahead uh, thank you pastor. pastor i just want to know that um ah. he, uh, can we differentiate uh doubt and double mind and little faith weak faith yes. so mm -hmm. uh how can we uh, come to a conclusion that uh, this is double mind and um, you know or this is little faith or um, huh. this is doubt. how we how we come to do that thank you okay sure so um so the distinction between double mindedness and uh, you know little faith little faith great faith no faith we've seen jesus talk about it uh, 
you have no faith or great is your faith so having double mindedness is clear cut unbelief but the degrees of faith or the levels of faith are faith okay so that is the first distinction for us so double mindedness is a form of unbelief whereas uh, little faith and you know different categories of faith are all levels of faith and jesus doesn't rebuke us uh, he uh, encourages us right to grow uh, he, he said that even like a little bit of a faith uh, can like a mustard seed can move a mountain so there is that encouragement when we have little bit of faith we must get more faith uh, double mindedness is when there is absolutely no faith and there's just confusion that exists in a person's mind and uh, i think it's a problem area in our soul uh, in the will part of us where we are not firm in making decisions that's why it says right a double minded man is unstable in all his ways he doesn't pick okay pick this or that he just doesn't pick so it's like a, i would say like a sickness of the soul where uh, it can happen one or two times but it can also be like a sickness of the soul where somebody is not making decisions so it's unbelief and it comes from a place of unbelief so does does that make sense yeah so uh, it means that uh, doubt also the same thing no 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 so doubt is not the same thing because see uh, when you say doubt that's what i said the man who came to jesus he said that uh, i believe but help my unbelief so to some degree doubt god understands that okay god understands that and uh, we can overcome our doubt and move in move ahead in faith but when we look at double mindedness it's more than doubt it's a it's a state of mind yeah i understood thank you so thank you pastor yes yes sure thank you thank you for that question okay let's go in for a break it's 9:53 let's come back at uh, 10:03 and we'll continue thank you <laughs> 